we get to trying to simulate uh, a two machine system and uh, what we will try to do today is try to bring out the phenomena of the movement of the center of mass or the center of inertia speed as well as the phenomena associated with the relative speed. Okay. Now, in the previous class we had seen an analogy with the spring mass system and uh, from that we had inf in fact inferred that uh, you know the there are two components of the motion that is the relative motion and the center of inertia motion. The center of inertia motion is affected by the external forces on the system. Now, what we will do today is actually uh, simulate a two machine system and at least some patterns uh, which we have identified in the simple spring mass uh, system analogy will be evident even here. So, that is what I wanted to show you, but we will do a, a relatively uh, detailed simulation. We will take a higher order machine model and we will also consider the effect of uh, AVR and uh, a governor. Okay. Of course, the AVR and governor models which we will be considering here will be fairly simplified. So, uh, but they will hopefully be successful in trying to bring out the essential or the important concept related to uh, the phenomena in two machine system. Okay. Of course, the aim of course eventually will be to try to uh, extrapolate what results we have got here to higher order or uh, really large multi machine system. Okay. Now, so in today's lecture we will take this two machine example and uh, try to study uh, certain stability phenomena uh, which are evident in integrated power systems. Okay. What we will do first, uh, we will get, get down to the actual work uh, and uh, the single line diagram of the system which we are going to consider is, is this. Okay. So, you have got uh, this is a load. This is a transmission line, this is a generator, this is also a load. This resistance here is 0.1 per unit, this is 0.3 per unit. This is basically uh, the important uh, thing to be noticed is this interconnection, which is a transmission line, of course. I remember, you are just taking an RL kind of uh, model of a transmission line. Uh, this is a lumped model. Okay. Uh, remember that in our discussion of transmission lines, we had seen that uh, lumped representation, uh, you know, even if you take a dynamical representation of a transmission line using a lumped model, that is, uh, you know, uh, have an inductance here, which will of course, be associated with a dynamical equation. The lumped model is likely to give you a reasonably correct results for low frequency phenomena. Okay. But of course, if you are studying switching and lightning transients, this is not an acceptable model. Okay. In fact, what we will see today is that we may even neglect the dynamics associated with this, uh, you know, this reactance here. Okay. So, that uh, of course, we will be coming to shortly. So, I have got two loads, the two generators are this is generator 2 and this is generator 1. The load in the at load bus, the load is a unity power factor load. Okay. So, if it is a unity power factor load. Uh, let us say it is its resistance, effect effectively let us represent it as a resistance. Okay. So, that let us assume that the resistance is 10 per unit. So, that would mean that the load is 0 0.1 per unit in case the voltage here is 1 angle okay, 1, 1 per unit. Okay. So, if your low voltage here is 1 per unit, the load resistance is 10 per unit, then effectively the power is 0 0.1 per unit. Okay. Similarly, here we have got a resistance of 0.5263 per unit, which corresponds to a load of roughly 1.9 per unit. Okay. So, you have got a load of 1 per 0.9 per unit here and a load of 0 0.1 per unit here. Okay. So, the total load in the system, if you look at uh, you know you can say P L 1 plus P L 2 is equal to 2 per unit, okay, roughly. There is also loss associated with this uh, resistance here. Okay. So, if there is some power flow uh, in this line, there will be a loss. Okay. So, P g 1 plus P g 2 in steady state will be roughly 2 per unit plus the losses. Okay. Now, one of the important points which you I hope you noted it in the previous uh, lecture was that when we considered the two mass spring example, if you did not want the center of 
uh, mass to move. You didn't want the frequency uh, equivalently. If you don't want the, uh, you know, uh, if you want to have an equilibrium in the center of inertia frequency in this system, you should ensure that PG1 plus PG2 is equal to PL1 plus PL2 plus the losses. Otherwise, there will be, of course, a transient in the center of inertia speed. Okay. Now, the thing here to be noted is that once you have got an integrated power system of this kind, you cannot really say that load 1 and load 2 are separately being you know individually being met by uh, generator 1 and 2. What we can say of course, is the total load is being met by the total generation. Okay. So, it is not necessarily true that P g 1 is meeting this load and P g 2 is meeting this load, though of course, you can arrange it in such a fashion. You could for example, have uh, all the load being met by the generation here and all the load here being met by this generation, but in this particular case we will not be doing that. We will in fact, have uh, roughly a power flow of 0.9 per unit. Of course, when I say power flow, the received power here is roughly 0.9 per unit. And uh, so, most so if you look at uh, how the generation is being done, okay, you will find that this P g 1 is not only serving this load, but is also pushing some power through this line and serving a part of this load. Okay. So, both the generators are roughly operating at uh, 1 uh, per unit okay, uh, power. Okay. And uh, P g 1 not only uh, P g 1 and P g 2 are serving both loads, but it is not certainly true that P g 1 is you know is adequate only for this load. It is actually pushing some power along this transmission line. In fact, because there are losses, the power flow here is roughly uh, power at the sending end is not equal to the receiving end. You have approximately 1.1 uh, per unit losses. Okay. So, actually if this is the situation, uh, you know a equilibrium situation. Okay. In fact, uh, you can if I tell you that voltage magnitude is being maintained at both buses at 1 per unit okay and this is one angle 0 okay and if uh, you know the sending end power flow is roughly 1 per unit okay you can actually compute what this angle is okay so this is some one angle minus theta okay so, theta of course, will be a positive number in this convention if I call it as minus theta. So, basically you can use the power flow expressions, uh, you, you know they are functions of the voltage magnitudes, the angular difference okay, and the resistance and reactance parameter of this line. So, you will be able to compute this theta okay, for this particular load flow situation. So, I am telling you that this is the situation. Uh, I will be giving the certain specifications. Okay, so what all, th what are the things I have specified? I have specified the load powers. I specified the, of course, the parameters of the system R and X here. I have specified the voltage magnitudes, and I have specified the sending end power here. You should be able to solve and get this theta from that. Okay, so this is the initial equilibrium situation. Okay, and as a result of this, you know, you'll you, this you can infer that this is supplying 1 per unit power and this is supplying 1 per unit power, 1.1 per unit power here and 1 per unit power here. This is the equilibrium situation. Okay. So, the starting point of analysis is a particular equilibrium about which we will be doing our analysis. So, one of the first steps you will have to do is back compute, you know, back calculate the phase angle of uh, rather I should say all the states of this synchronous generator and the, synch uh, the states of the synchronous generator. Okay. So, you, we can calculate the equilibrium conditions or the equilibrium values of all the states of the system. Okay. The states of the system of course, are in case you are representing this by a dynamical equation the currents, okay. then uh, all the fluxes in the machine delta and omega of the machines. Okay. So, this is true of course, for both machines. So, this is uh, how we will start our study. Okay. Now, how do you proceed is from the load flow solution, I had already shown you in the uh, simulations of an AVR how to come back compute the values of the states once you know the nature of the voltage at the terminal. Okay. So, if I tell you that 
the terminal voltage is you know a certain uh, you know has a certain wave shape for example one angle zero would mean according to our convention the voltage a n the voltage across the phase a n across the stator winding of the generator 1 would be root 2 by 3 sin omega t. This is what I mean by 1 angle 0. Of course, uh, it is balanced and uh, of course, we see n is equal to root 2 by 3. plus 2 pi by 3. Of course, this omega is the equilibrium speed. Okay? So, the equilibrium speed let us call it omega naught without loss of any generality let us assume it is 50 hertz. Okay? So, omega naught will be 2 pi into 50 that is 314 radians per second approximately. Okay? Now, uh, one angle theta or uh, one angle minus theta would mean that V a n at the terminals of that generator is Okay, this would be minus theta. Okay, and so on. So we'll have VCN and uh, VBN two. Okay, so we can take out the waveforms of uh, uh, each of these generators. Now, once you, of course, know the terminal voltages of uh, the synchronous machine, you can compute. Uh, rather, we uh, remember that the main question is how to compute the states of the system. Okay? So, delta 1, omega 1 and all the fluxes of that machine, the equilibrium values. You can do that if you know uh, for example, the electrical power output of the generator and the reactive power output of the generator. So, if you know the current under equilibrium conditions, if you know the current waveforms under equilibrium conditions, okay, just like how I have given you a terminal voltage, I can get the current waveforms. How do I get the current waveforms? By solving the circuit for a certain specifications, you can get this theta. Once you get this theta, you will be able to get the current through this line. You will also be able to get the current phasor through this load. So, the generator current can be obtained. From the generating generator current phasor, you can compute the instantaneous values of I A, I B and I C. From I A, I B and I C, you can actually compute all the values of the states. Okay? So, if you know I A, I B, I C and the terminal voltages as well, okay, then you can actually back compute all the values of the states. Okay? So, this is something we have done during our simulation of an AVR. So, I will not repeat it here. You can refer to that lecture. The same thing can be done for the second machine. Okay? Once you know these terminal voltages, you can compute delta y, delta 2 omega 2 and all the states okay of that of that machine okay of course if you are considering avr and governor you will have additional states okay you just don't have delta omega and the fluxes but you also have for example the states associated with the avr and excitation system and also the governor and the turbine uh, turbine system okay so you have got these additional states okay so there are additional states so i'll just write this to denote this, there are some other states. I have just put a sign plus here, means that you have other states also. Okay? So, first step is of course, compute the equilibrium values of uh, all the states of the synchronous machine. You can do that. Okay? Now, remember this is one point which I emphasized in the last class. You are going to write down all the equations of your synchronous machine. Okay? Now, one of the important points is that your equations of the asynchronous machine are all uh, in the paths reference frame, we derived it in the paths reference frame, but in case you are going to do any interfacing with other generators, it is important that before you apply KVL and KCL that is Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff voltage law, all the voltages and current should be on a common reference frame. For example, if you are computed Consider this situation. If you are considering a system of this kind, if you have computed, for example, I D and I Q using the paths reference frame attached to this machine, that is theta is equal to theta 1 is equal to omega t plus delta. These are the arguments used in your DQ transformation. Okay? 
and if you have used another transformation and obtained i d and i q for this generator okay, and suppose the current in the load is also computed using for example, the reference frame okay, the d q transformation okay, using this theta 1. So, I will call this l 1 i l d 1 and i l q 1. In that case, it is will not be possible to say that i d 1 plus i d 2 okay, is equal to i l d 1. It is not possible because these currents although it is true that K V L I A 1 the, the I A 1, I A 2 and I load the A phase they satisfy K V L Kirchhoff's uh, sorry uh, K C L that is Kirchhoff's current law, but it is not true that I D 1, I D 2 and I L I L D 1 they will not satisfy uh, K C L unless that is I will not be able to say that this plus this is equal to this it's not we cannot say this we can say this yes, okay, but we cannot say this okay, because the transformation from these currents to these currents has not been done with the same transformation the transformation used here and here is different. So, what you instead do instead of using uh, you know whenever you are doing any kind of interfacing with the network or with another generator it is important to write down your equations okay, in the common frame of reference. So, even if you have for example, written down these equations here in the reference frame local to this generator that is you are using theta 1 in the arguments in the Parkes transformation and theta 2 in the arguments of the Parkes transformation here. Whenever you are going to use K C L convert these currents to a common reference frame. Okay. So, one of the ways you can do it is of course, use uh, what is known as Kronz reference frame or a reference frame which is not dependent on any generator. Okay. So, what you do is uh, what I will try to show you here. This is the Parkes transformation which you will use for the first machine. You will formulate all your equations in the d q reference frame, but you will be using this transformation of variables. Okay. So, you will be using this transformation of variables. Instead of that can you use this transformation? The answer is yes, you can and the variables f q 1, f t 1 and f q and f d are related by this relationship. You can easily work this out. Remember that f a, f b, f c are the three phase variables, they remain unchanged. You are using a transformation c p 1 to convert to f d 1, f q 1 and f 0. Okay. If you use C k instead, it is easy to see that if C k is given by this C p by this, then the variables in the upper case or capital d q frame and the small d q frame are related by this relationship. So, what really is the procedure you should apply in case you are trying to interface different generators? What you need to do is you can formulate the generator equations in using C p the local frame. Okay. So, you so from that local frame you will get i d and i q. Okay. Then convert this i d and i q using delta 1 to i d and i q. Okay. So, use this transformation e raise to j delta 1 as I mentioned here okay, in the slide. So, can you have a look at the slide again? So, you can use this slide to convert you know the small d q variables to the you know capital D q variables. Okay. Now, what you do with this? This is for generator 1. You do the same thing for generator 2. You can you can formulate all your equations in the local frame. Okay. But whenever you are going to use any kind of interfacing with the rest of the system, okay, you use these variables are on a common reference frame, and you can use 
they are using the same transformation from the basic A B C variables. So, once you have these variables on a common frame, you can apply K C L and K B L. Okay. So, this is an important point whenever you are modeling the system. Okay. So, you can for example, write down uh, the equations of a network okay, in the d q frame of reference. Remember, we had formulated uh, you know the equations of a transmission line for example, in the A B C frame and then we can convert them into the d q frame. Okay. So, the d q frame which you are going to use can use c k the transformation c k. So, the network the network equations as well as all the current injections from various generators have to be transformed to a common reference frame before you apply k v l and k c l. Okay. So, what you need to do is of course, whenever you are interfacing with the network okay, or with another generator directly, you convert all the variables to a common reference frame. Okay. So, that is very, very, very important. So, in this particular for example, system we have got a network which is like this, this is a load which I mentioned some time back was in fact a unity power factor load which is of course, voltage dependent because I have told that it is a resistive type load also. Okay. So, I have assumed that the load is voltage dependent, it is dependent on the square of magnitude of the voltage. So, you have got a system like this. So, this is your network. Okay. So, this is your network and you can write down the equations of this directly in using the transformation C k. So, for example, the current here uh, in this resistance, let us call it R 1 and R 2. Okay is for example, you can directly write the relationship if this is bus 1 and this is bus 2 and you can write V d 1 plus J V d 2 sorry, I am sorry, I am sorry. So, V q 1 plus J V d 1 is equal to R 1 into the current through this. Okay. So, I will call this I q 1 plus J I d 1. Okay. Actually, uh, what effect I have got these, this is a complex relationship. Okay. It is rather these are complex numbers, but what you need to really see here is V q 1 is equal to R 1 into I q 1. So, V d 1 is equal to R 1 into I d 1. So, these are actually two separate equations. Instead of writing it in matrix form, I have written it compactly in this form. Okay. So, you can easily get these equations from Okay, and applying the transformation C k in order to convert to the capital D q variable. So, once you use this C k, you can convert this to D q, you can you convert this to D q and this is what you will eventually get. The algebraic equation here will be like this. Similarly, if you look at this you know uh, equation, this x is for example, in this example 0 0.3 and r is 0 0.1. Okay. In this example, you will see that this in this system, the equations for the transmission line are of course, differential equations. Okay. So, you, if, uh, if you of course, assume that you can use a lumped model with just a uh, series lumped reactants, then you have got this uh, differential equations. Now, we saw in the, uh, our discussion in transmission lines, if you convert this using uh, d q transformation, okay, if you convert this using c k, what you will get in steady state, I am not talking of the you know um, the differential equation, in steady state you will get very surprisingly I q line so J I D line okay, is equal to V q 1 plus J V D 1 minus V q 2 plus J V D 2 divided by r plus j x. So, this is the relationship which you get in steady state. Okay. This of course, assumes this assumes that omega naught is the same as omega b the base frequency. Okay. So, x is equal to omega b into l. Okay, so, this is an assumption, okay, but this is only true in steady state. If you wanted to write the differential equation, which in, in fact took into account 
the rate of change of current that is I have assumed here that d i q l is equal to d t and d i d l by d t is equal to 0. So, this is an assumption which I made. Okay. So, just remember this. So, this is only valid in steady state. Okay. Otherwise, of course, I will get a differential equation okay, uh, in d i d l and d i q uh, l and this is something which we have discussed some time back in our uh, uh, discussion of transmission lines. Okay. So, for every element uh, of this network or this part of the system, okay, you can get differential equations or algebraic equations. Okay. If you assume that the network is always in steady state and there is it is not uh, what we call if you neglect network transients, then actually all these equations become you know if all the d by d t's are neglected then all these become algebraic equations and surprisingly the algebraic equation looks very neat they almost look like phasor equations actually these algebraic equations for example this is representative of two algebraic equations which you get when we set this equal to 0 okay so this complex notation is a compact notation as well now so if i neglect network transients if i don't want to neglect them of course I should write down the differential equations. You can neglect the differential equations provided the transients of interest are slow. Okay. So, do not make this assumption for example, while studying lightning or switching transients or fast transients. Suppose, you are trying to understand uh, you know how the network uh, interacts with say a fast controller like an HVDC controller, the power electronics in an HVDC controller. Then of course, please do not make this kind of assumption. In fact, you may even want to model a transmission line by a more detailed equivalent. You may try to use a traveling wave model of a transmission line. Okay. So, this neglection of d by d t is a very, uh, a very big assumption to make provided, but it is okay provided you are interested only in understanding the slow transient. One interesting thing is that if your load is just a resistive load and your transmission line also is represented by um, algebraic equations instead of differential equations with the understanding of course, that you are going to study slow transients, then you can represent the network completely by algebraic equations. And in fact, you will notice that you should be able to write down for all nodes, for example, in this system, I am sorry. So, this will be I q 1 plus j i d 1 is I q 2 plus j i d 2. So, it is of course, will not look very nice. Okay. So, this will be like your admittance matrix. In fact, it is the admittance matrix. If you just try to work it out, you will find that what you will get is the admittance two port admittance matrix for this system. Okay. Of course, this representation of the network is assuming network transients are neglected. Okay. So, that is something which you should notice. So, what you have here is of course, the generator is represented by differential equations from which you can get the currents i d 1, i q 1. So, generator 1 will have currents i d 1 and i q 1. These currents are injections into your network, static network and static loads. So, load also is actually is absorbed as a part of the network because it is purely resistive. Of course, this will not be true in case you have got rotating loads in which you are representing for example, a large induction machine by differential equations. In that case, you cannot represent it as a part of the static network. Okay. So, this is your network which is represented by i injection is equal to y into v you know i injection of course means this vector okay similarly the other generator is injecting id2 and iq2 remember id2 and iq2 are functions of the flux by an algebraic relationship okay so of course id1 and iq1 id2 and iq2 and all the current injection uh, and voltage vectors here are obtained from A B C using the C K transformation okay? or from remember that if your generator has been formulated, generator equations have been formulated using the local Parkes reference frame using theta 1 and theta 2. In that case, you have to use delta 1 and delta 2 to transform those currents to those compatible with this transformation. 
Okay. Now, remember that the network once you give the in current injections uh, from the network effectively you get by solving the network you get the information which will be required to compute the next value of the states. Okay. So, V q 2, V d 2 and V q 1 and V d 1 are in fact uh, voltages at the terminals of a synchronous machine okay, in this reference frame. So, again you have to use delta 1 and delta 2 uh, in order to get the same voltages in the small d q local reference frames okay. and those can be used by the differential equations. Okay. In fact, they are inputs to the differential equations. Okay. So, this is how your system looks like. In fact, if you look at the exciter, it will be also taking this information okay, because it requires the feedback of the voltage magnitude at the terminal of the generator, compare it with the local reference voltage and give the field voltage to this generator. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that a turbine governor system is something which affects the mechanical power input to the generator. This is present here also. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things uh, which it is a kind of a diversion, but you can try to prove that if I use the variable C k, uh, the, the capital D q variables, then you can show that F d square plus F q square any for any a b c variable if you transform it to the capital D q frame it is also equal to. So, this is an interesting thing you know okay, for where can you use it for example, if you are trying to compute the magnitude the instantaneous magnitude of the voltage at the terminals of a generator I remember we have had a discussion about what 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 we meaning we can assign to instantaneous magnitude. Okay. So, if I want to use the instantaneous magnitude, one way we can define it is V d square plus V q square, okay, which is also equal to V small capital D 1 square plus V small capital Q 1 square. Okay. So, that is an interesting uh, uh, point, which is of course, uh, which can be used when you actually program. So, what I am trying to do here is of course, my main aim here is to actually tell you about phenomena, but all the same, I have tried to tell you a bit about how you will formulate your equations and actually solve them. So, what you really have are differential equations delta 1, omega 1, the generator, these are corresponding to the generator 1, delta 1, omega 1, the fluxes psi d, psi q, psi f, psi g and psi k for the first generator the states they may be 1, 2, 3 or 4 depending on how you represent your exciter. So, I will just call this x c, these are states of the exciter, okay. I will call them by uh, x under bar because there may be more than 1. Okay. Similarly, the turbine and the governor may have several states associated with the turbine, the actuator and the controller which is the governor. Similarly, exciter may involve some states corresponding to the excitation power apparatus as well as the AVR, the automatic voltage regulator and other controllers. Okay. So, these are the states of the system, the generator 1. Similarly, you have states of the generator 2 okay. and then you have got the states of the network. In case you are neglecting the states of the network okay, that is neglecting the d by d t. For example, in this example you could neglect d i d by d t and d i q by d t, you could set them to 0, which means of course, that the model is suitable only for slow transients. Okay. Then in that case you will not get differential equations for the network, the network will be represented only by static equations. Okay. Of course, if you are neglecting the network equations, it makes sense to neglect the transients associated with d psi d, it is just a consistency. Okay. Neglect these transients also, so set this equal to 0 also. So, what you will have is instead of if you are neglecting network and stator transients, then your states are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. There are 5, uh, have I missed out one? Yeah, okay. there is one psi h 1 also. So, 6. Okay. So, you will have 6 states plus the states associated with the exciter and turbine governor system. Okay. 
So, you will have 6 plus you know let us say n e plus n g this for each generator. So, you will have you multiply this by 2 is the total number of differential equations which you will have. Okay. Remember that the differential equations corresponding to psi d and psi q and the network differential equations can be set to 0 okay, or they can be converted to algebraic equations okay, provided you are studying slow transients, but do not make this assumption in case you are studying faster transients. Okay. So, this is these are the total number of states and one way of solving this whole system is to discretize of course, the differential equations okay, using some numerical integration method. The algebraic equations in fact, you you will uh, you can just directly solve them. Okay. Now, uh, in fact, if you look at the algebraic equations which are there, okay, the algebraic equations actually can be solved. Are they linear algebraic equations? Just think over that. Okay. Are you going to get linear algebraic equations? The answer is kind of the point is that the network to a very I means for example, the way we have written it is in fact a linear network. So, to get if I give you i to get v simply involves solving this linear system of equations, okay. but remember that i itself is a function of psi d psi q. Okay. So, you have got is a function of psi d psi q of each generator as well as the other fluxes. Okay. Remember that equation which we had? Yeah, this for example, psi d is equal to x t double dash into i d plus these states. Okay. In addition, if you set this to 0, d psi d by d t is equal to 0 when you are studying slow transients, then I got you know an algebraic equation here and another algebraic equation here. Okay. Similarly, you have got for the q axis an algebraic equation here and in case you are neglecting stator transients then an algebraic equation here. So, in fact, if you neglect stator transient the generator itself has got 4 algebraic equations, 4 algebraic equations. Okay. The network is all algebraic equations. Okay. So, in case you neglect stator transients you have 4 algebraic equations otherwise you have got 2 algebraic equations which relate i and psi. Okay. So, what you need to do is gather up all the algebraic equations and then solve them. Okay. But remember the algebraic equations can be solved, but remember that they have got certain inputs. The, the state variables okay, that is psi f, psi h, psi g and psi k for each generator as well as delta and omega delta come into the equations. How do they come into the equations? Remember that the algebraic equations you see here have psi k and psi g. Okay. So, that is how these states come into the equations. Okay. Moreover, V d and this particular equation V d, V q, uh, V d sorry V q and I q okay, has to be converted to capital D q reference frame. So, you need to have delta. Remember that when you you know what you call interfacing all the algebraic equations together all the current should be got to one reference frame okay, and that requires you to actually use delta. Okay. So, the algebraic equations are in fact functions of delta. Okay. So, at every time step when you solve algebraic equations there will be functions of delta at that point. Okay. So, in fact uh, solving these algebraic equations will require you to do you know in principle a matrix inversion. Okay. Actually, matrix inversion is not a very nice way to do things uh, when the matrix is very large. You will be actually using uh, when you come to larger systems, uh, it would not be a good idea to use uh, you know explicitly compute inverses, okay. because uh, not only do they require a lot of storage, okay. usually an inverse even if your original uh, matrices when you are solving algebraic equations are sparse, when you computer explicitly and inverse the matrix becomes full. Okay. So, that is one of the reasons why you will not uh, you know explicitly take out inverses and of course, if your algebraic equations are functions of delta and delta is changing at every time step one problem which you should grapple with is that for every step you will have to solve a set of 
algebraic equations. Okay. So, at every step you will have to redo this kind of uh, solving of algebraic equations. You can avoid all this if uh, you can do some tricks. Okay. So, these tricks of course, I will not uh, spend right now time on. We are talking of a very small system. So, solving algebraic equations at every time step itself is not a very difficult or very heavy computational burden. Okay. But remember when you are trying to solve very large systems, you will be faced with a problem of uh, how to you know represent the system or what kind of trick to use. So, that uh, you will not have to solve very large uh, number of uh, algebraic equations and you do not have to actually do inversion or even you know uh, what you call um, what the, the technique which is used is of course, LU factorization and you do not have to do this factorization at every time step. Okay. So, this is something of course, you will not probably understand at this point. Uh, you can of course, just remember this issue whenever you are going to study large uh, you know large systems when you are actually trying to make a program in which which is trying to you know uh, trying to simulate a very large system okay but for small system uh, you will have to solve algebraic equations you can even take the inverse explicitly at every time step okay uh, it's not a very big computational burden for a small system okay but remember that uh, this issue uh, when you are talking of very large systems okay you will have to use some tricks uh, it in order to make your computation burden a bit lower. Okay. So, this is how you will simulate the system. So, what you need to do of course, is uh, get the equilibrium conditions, you have got the algebraic equations, discretize the uh, differential equation. Incidentally, incidentally, when you discretize the differential equation, it becomes an algebraic equation. So, eventually uh, all of your uh, simulation becomes the solution of algebraic equations. Okay. Now, uh, once we uh, start simulating the system, in fact, if, if all your states are at equilibrium, your system will just stay where it is. But for example, if I change something in the system, for example, uh, I change this resistance, this load resistance, I change the load effectively, then you will find that uh, the algebraic equations have changed and as a result of which the equilibrium itself has changed. Now, when you change an equilibrium, you are at present you know at a certain equilibrium. Now, the equilibrium itself has changed. Okay. So, you are away from the new equilibrium, you are, you are at present at the old equilibrium and you want to go to the new equilibrium. So, there will be some transient. Okay. So, what you need to do is of course, whenever you are simulating a system, you need to tell your program at this point of time change the algebraic equations. Okay. So, once you change the algebraic equation, you will start seeing a transient. Okay, because you are not at the new equilibrium, you are not you are you are initially at some other equilibrium. Okay. So, uh, let us uh, directly uh, start understanding. So, where we are uh, we were here at this point, let us represent both the generators are identical which have got identical control systems. We have got an automatic voltage regulator which is practically maintaining the terminal voltage of this system at 1 per unit. So, even um, so your AVR control strategy is to maintain the terminal voltage at 1 per unit. So, I will just get this diagram again, so that we can uh, have a better idea of what is happening. So, this is our system diagram, you are maintaining this terminal voltage here at 1 per unit. Incidentally, uh, we have considered a very simple system. Okay. Uh, with no transformers and so on. You can actually increase the complexity of the system, but that would not be necessary to try to tell you about the basic phenomena. So, right now let us consider only this simple system where I am maintaining this terminal voltage here at 1 per unit okay, using an AVR. Okay. The turbine governor system of both machines has got this transfer function. So, 20 into 1 upon 1 plus 2 s upon 1 upon divided by 1 plus 6 s. Okay. So, this is a very, very simplified model of a governing system and a turbine. Okay. So, the governor is assumed to be a simple gain of 20 okay. and uh, the turbine has as we assume has got a transfer function 1 upon 1 plus 2 s upon 1 plus 6 s. Okay. So, this is a very simplified model of a uh, steam turbine. In fact, uh, it is basically neglecting uh, the dynamics associated with uh, the crossover piping as well as 
the steam chest okay so it's it's a kind of model which is very simplified okay so, but this is enough of course to tell us about the phenomena okay like load sharing etc okay but please do not use this model in case you want to get realistic results especially for large disturbances okay both the avr as well as uh, the excitation system as well as the output of the governor okay are limited in the sense that we do not of course change the mechanical power beyond certain limits and also the avr the field voltage is not allowed to exceed certain limits these limits in case of the avr are plus or minus 6 per unit so you know you got fairly high uh, you know uh, high ceiling voltages for the avr okay now um, what we uh, uh, need to of course uh, understand next is some of the important issues is purely resistive loads or loads are resistive we are considering three phase balance conditions all the the transmission line the loads all are balanced even our you know disturbances which we will be considering are balanced in fact an interesting thing to chew upon is in case you have got unbalance, uh, does it complicate our analysis? The answer is yes. In fact, uh, if you try to formulate the DQ equations of an unbalanced network, you will find that uh, it is dependent on omega naught t. So, that makes you know the algebraic equations also time dependent. You know, So, this is something very interesting uh, which you can think about. Uh, we have considered identical parameters in both machines. Okay? So, this is just an interest just, just for keeping things absolutely simple. Okay? the identical synchronous machine parameters of both machines are the parameters of the synchronous machine are given here okay so one of the interesting points which you should notice here well it's not really uh, something which we have imposed in this is that this generator is generating 1.1 per unit power so actually it's generating slightly more uh, than the rated mv of the machine so this is some something which we have uh, is that's why i would say that this is a very academic example why would anybody load a synchronous machine more than its MVA? It can't be done really. Okay, so this is a small drawback of our example, but it's a minor uh, issue in the sense that, again, as I mentioned, this is just a conceptual example to tell you about some stability phenomena. Okay, so this is a just a reality check. Okay, now one of the things you can actually do is get the eigenvalues of the system. In fact, if you you know you have got your algebraic and differential equations you can linearize around the differential equations around an equilibrium point note that these are non-linear equations and you can't directly get eigenvalues corresponding to a state matrix because the equations are non-linear so what we can do instead uh, in a, if you want to do small signal stability analysis is consider an equilibrium point okay get the equilibrium values of the states form the linearized matrices for the system Okay, and then compute the eigenvalues of the state matrices. And very interestingly, if you consider network transients, okay, that is, if I consider the di by dt's of the network, did by dt and diq by dt of the network, I don't set it equal to zero. I write the differential equation. Similarly, if I write the differential equations of psi d and psi q as well for both generators, in that case, what you notice, in fact, these are two tables. One on your left here. The first two columns on the left the first two the last two columns on your right are the equations with governor and without governor okay now what you notice here is some if network transients are considered some very large eigenvalues are seen okay with real part the imaginary parts are near about 314 radians per second that is near about omega naught okay these are very large eigenvalues okay Similarly, without governor also you have got these large eigenvalues, but network and stator transients are considered. So, stator d, d by dt, uh, d psi d by dt, d psi q by dt are considered. You get very large eigenvalues. Okay. With and without governor, the difference is that without governor you have got two zero eigenvalues. You got two zero eigenvalues. With the governor, you will get one zero eigenvalue, one negative eigenvalue and you also get two additional eigenvalues that is because the number of states increases with the governor remember that the turbine governing system has got one state so if you got two generators you will have two extra states and therefore you got two extra eigenvalues here as compared to here without governor okay 
So, of course, one of the things which is very striking is uh, you know is this particular mode, okay? This complex pair of eigenvalues which are representative of the electromechanical swings. We have seen these swings before okay, in a single machine infinite bus system. They appear here too, but the important thing is without governor in addition to these swings you also have these two 0 eigenvalues. So, in fact, in the previous lecture I mentioned that if you have a two spring mass, two mass spring system, you have got one oscillatory mode and one mode corresponding to the motion of the center of inertia. In fact, the motion of the center of inertia is associated with two 0 eigenvalues in case there is no friction in the surface. Okay. So, if you do not actually provide uh, for any friction and you have got a two machine a two mass spring system, you have got a complex pair of eigenvalues and two 0 eigenvalues which really talk about the motion of the center of mass of the system. In fact, if you give an unbalanced or rather if you give a disturbance which causes this motion of center of inertia to be excited, you will find that in fact, if you do not have friction this will just keep on moving and as a result of which displacement of individual masses will keep on changing with time. Okay. In fact, you give a suppose this spring mass system you give a disturbance to both masses and they start moving together, they will keep on moving because there is no friction. Okay. So, in fact, the two 0 eigenvalues result in a motion result in as we mentioned last time a component of motion which has got which looks like this. Okay. So, if you have got a spring mass system and if I give a push to both masses you will find that the whole system starts moving the center of mass of the system starts moving this side and if there is no friction it will continue moving moving. So, if you look at the displacement with this reference to some reference you will find that the displacement keeps on changing the states will keep on changing. Okay. Of course, if you put some friction okay, you will find that even if I give an initial displacement this will eventually settle down. Okay. So, if there is some initial displacement of the center of inertia you will find that this will kind of settle down. Okay. So, if you have certain uh, so what you will find in your eigenvalue analysis is in fact a reflection of this. A governor in fact is something which kind of plays the role of viscous friction. In fact, if your loads were frequency dependent also you would have another mechanism in which you had had friction. So, what happens is that in case there is certain load generation balance, if you have friction or if you have got generation and load a function of frequency that is what viscous friction really means. If you have got something which is a function of the frequency, if you make your mechanical power or the load power a function of frequency, you will find that the system kind of settles to an equilibrium, you know you will settle to an equilibrium speed even if there is a imbalance in the you know external forces on the system. Okay. So, that is one important point. So, if you look at the eigenvalues of the system, if you have no governor you have got two 0 eigenvalues and therefore, in case there is any load generation imbalance there will be a continuous increase in the velocity as well as the displacement or the angular displacement of the machines. Okay. This is something we will see in the simulation in the next class. Okay. With the governor of course, you are bringing some frequency dependence in the generated power. Okay. So, in some sense there is a mechanism by which frequency can reach an equilibrium in case there is an imbalance. So, if there is a load generation imbalance frequency will change, if frequency changes you will find that the mechanical power changes. So, some equilibrium speed is eventually reached. So, in fact, with a governor okay, one of the eigenvalues becomes negative. Okay. So, these two eigenvalues in fact with governor and with governor are in fact associated with the motion of the center of inertia of the system and these swing modes or these oscillatory uh, or these eigenvalues corresponding to low frequency oscillations here as well as here are nothing but the swing modes associated with the relative motion of the machines. Okay. 
So, although you have got many other eigenvalues, a very interesting thing is that the pattern associated with the electromechanical states is in fact very close to that of the pattern observed in just a two mass spring system. In a two mass spring system, you just have four states. In a two generator system with loads, you have many, many more than four states. But this phenomena which you see which corresponds to the electrical electromechanical modes can be captured by this what seem to be a crude analogy of a two mass spring system. Okay. Now, in the next lecture, we will actually do a simulation of the system. This is an Eigen analysis. In fact, uh, you know there are many, many, many patterns which you see, many, many Eigen values which you are seeing here. Okay. But we shall also see uh, a simulation in which we will try to you know try to see or look for these kind of uh, patterns in the behavior okay and we will in fact see that for small disturbances the eigen analysis and uh, the simulation in fact match but for large disturbances we do see instability in relative motion what we have all always called in this course as loss of synchronism so with this kind of uh, uh, curtain raiser for next times lecture which will be actually showing you the simulation results uh, let us conclude here.